The view that the Bible should be accepted as historically accurate and as a reliable guide to morality has been questioned by many scholars in the field of biblical criticism. In addition to concerns about morality, inerrancy, or historicity, there remain some questions of which books should be included in the Bible. History of the Bible the Hebrew Bible, upon which the Christian Old Testament is based, was originally composed in Biblical Hebrew, except for parts of Daniel and Ezra that were written in Biblical Aramaic. These writings depict Israelite religion from its beginnings to about the 2nd century BC. The Christian New Testament was written in Koine Greek, see Language of the New Testament for details. Historicity. Topic. Biblical minimalism is a label applied to a loosely knit group of scholars who hold that the Bible's version of history is not supported by any archaeological evidence so far unearthed, thus the Bible cannot be trusted as a history source. Critics of the authenticity of the New Testament such as Richard Carrier and Paul N. Tobin argue that pseudepigrapha within the New Testament invalidates it as a reliable source of information. Author Richard I. Purvo details the non-historical sources of the Book of Acts. Authorship At the end of the 17th century few Bible scholars doubted that Moses wrote the Torah, but in the late 18th century some liberal scholars began to question his authorship, and by the end of the 19th century some went as far as to claim that as a whole the work was of many more authors over many centuries from 1000 BC the time of David to 500 BC the time of Ezra, and that the history it contained was often more polemical rather than strictly factual. By the first half of the 20th century Hermann Gunkel had drawn attention to mythic aspects, and Albrecht Alt, Martin Noth and the Tradition History School argued that although its core traditions had genuinely ancient roots, the narratives were fictional framing devices and were not intended as history in the modern sense. In the second century, the Gnostics often claimed that their form of Christianity was the first, and they regarded Jesus as a teacher, or allegory. Elaine Pagels has proposed that there are several examples of Gnostic attitudes in the Pauline epistles. Bart D. Ehrman and Raymond E. Brown note that some of the Pauline epistles are widely regarded by scholars as pseudonymous, and it is the view of Timothy Freak, and others, that this involved a forgery in an attempt by the Church to bring in Paul's Gnostic supporters and turn the arguments in the other epistles on their head. Topic. Canonicity. The Hebrew Bible and Christian Bibles are works considered sacred and authoritative writings by their respective faith groups that revere their specific collections of biblical writings. The limits of the canon were effectively set in the early church, however the status of the scriptures has been a topic of scholarly discussion in the later church. Increasingly, the biblical works have been subjected to literary and historical criticism in an effort to interpret the biblical texts, independent of church and dogmatic influences. In the middle of the second century, Marcion of Sinop proposed rejecting the entire Jewish Bible. He considered the God portrayed therein to be a lesser deity, a demiurge, and that the law of Moses was contrived. Jews discount the New Testament and Old Testament deuterocanonicals, Jews and some Christians discredit the legitimacy of New Testament apocrypha, and a view sometimes referred to as Jesusism does not affirm the scriptural authority of any biblical text other than the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels. <laughs> Mythology Topic. The validity of the Gospels is challenged by writers such as Kersey Graves who claimed that mythic stories, that have parallels in the life of Jesus, support the conclusion that the Gospel writers incorporated them into the story of Jesus and also Gerald Massey, who specifically claimed that the life story of the Egyptian god Horus was copied by Christian Gnostics. Parallels have also been drawn between Greek myths and the life of Jesus. The comparative mythology of Jesus Christ examines the parallels that have been proposed for the biblical portrayal of Jesus in comparison to other religious or mythical domains. Some critics have alleged that Christianity is not founded on a historical figure, but rather on a mythical creation. 
One of these views proposes that Jesus was the Jewish manifestation of a pan-Hellenic cult, known as Osiris Dionysus. Christ myth theory proponents claim that the age, authorship, and authenticity of the Gospels can not be verified, thus the Gospels can not bear witness to the historicity of Jesus. This is in contrast with writers such as David Strauss, who regarded only the supernatural elements of the Gospels as myth, but whereas these supernatural myths were a point of contention, there was no refutation of the Gospels' authenticity as witness to the historicity of Jesus. Critics of the Gospels such as Richard Dawkins and Thomas Henry Huxley note that they were written long after the death of Jesus and that we have no real knowledge of the date of composition of the Gospels. Annie Besant and Thomas Paine note that the authors of the Gospels are not known. Topic. Translation issues Topic. Translation of scripture into the vernacular such as English and hundreds of other languages, though a common phenomenon, is also a subject of debate and criticism. For readability, clarity, or other reasons, translators may choose different wording or sentence structure, and some translations may choose to paraphrase passages. Because many of the words in the original language have ambiguous or difficult to translate meanings, debates over correct interpretation occur. For instance, at creation, Gen 1 to 2 is Ru Lim, Ruach Elohim, the wind of God, spirit of God, i.e., the Holy Spirit in Christianity, or a mighty wind over the primordial deep. In Hebrew, Ru Ruach can mean wind, breath, or spirit. Both ancient and modern translators are divided over this and many other such ambiguities. Another example is the word used in the Masoretic text Isa to indicate the woman who would bear Emmanuel is alleged to mean a young, unmarried woman in Hebrew, while Matthew chapter 1 verse 23 follows the Septuagint version of the passage that uses the Greek word parthenos, translated virgin, and is used to support the Christian idea of virgin birth. Those who view the Masoretic text, which forms the basis of most English translations of the Old Testament, as being more accurate than the Septuagint, and trust its usual translation, may see this as an inconsistency, whereas those who take the Septuagint to be accurate may not. More recently, several discoveries of ancient manuscripts such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, and Codex Sinaiticus, have led to modern translations like the New International Version differing somewhat from the older ones such as the 17th century King James Version, removing verses not present in the earliest manuscripts see list of omitted Bible verses, some of which are acknowledged as interpolations, such as the Comma Johannium, others having several highly variant versions in very important places, such as the resurrection scene in Mark 16. The King James only movement rejects these changes and uphold the King James version as the most accurate. Topic: Ethics. Topic: Some of the most commonly criticized ethical choices include treatment of women, religious intolerance, use of capital punishment as penalty for violation of Mosaic law, sexual acts like incest, toleration of the institution of slavery in both Old and New Testaments, obligatory religious wars and the order to commit the genocide of the Canaanites and the Amalekites. Christian apologists support the Bible's decisions by reminding critics that they should be considered from the author point of view and that Mosaic law applied to the Israelite people who lived before the birth of Jesus. Other religious groups see nothing wrong with the Bible's judgments. Apologists also point to the fact that nearly without exception, these criticisms are refuted or negated by statements or doctrines made or clarified by Jesus in the New Testament. One example that is often cited is the biblical law of the rebellious son. If any man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or his mother, and when they chastise him, he will not even listen to them, then his father and mother shall seize him, and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gateway of his home town. And they shall say to the elders of his city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious, he will not obey us, he is a glutton and a drunkard, then all the men of his city shall stone him to death, so you shall remove the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear of it and fear." doi, 2118-21 Skeptics often criticize this response, claiming that apologists are appealing to moral relativism, which is a widely criticized stance on morality. Other critics of the Bible, such as Friedrich Nietzsche who popularized the phrase, God is dead, have questioned the morality of the New Testament, regarding it as weak and conformist-oriented. 
Topic: Internal consistency. Topic: There are many places in the Bible in which inconsistencies such as different numbers and names for the same feature, and different sequences for the same events, have been alleged and presented by critics as difficulties. Responses to these criticisms include the modern documentary hypothesis, the two-source hypothesis and theories that the pastoral epistles are pseudonymous. However, authors such as Raymond Brown have presented arguments that the Gospels actually contradict each other in various important respects and on various important details. W. D. Davies and E. P. Sanders state that on many points, especially about Jesus' early life, the evangelists were ignorant, they simply did not know, and, guided by rumor, hope or supposition, did the best they could." More critical scholars see the nativity stories either as completely fictional accounts, or at least constructed from traditions that predate the Gospels. For example, many versions of the Bible specifically point out that the most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses did not include Mark chapter 16 verses 9 to 20, i.e., the Gospel of Mark originally ended at Mark chapter 16 verse 8, and additional verses were added a few hundred years later. This is known as the Markan Appendix. Mosaic authorship, authorship of the Gospels and authorship of the Pauline epistles are topics that remain widely debated. The Bible and science Origins <inaudible> 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 A common point of criticism against the Bible is the Genesis creation narrative. According to Young Earth Creationism, which takes a literal view of the book of Genesis, the universe and all forms of life on Earth were created directly by God sometime between 5,700 and 10,000 years ago. This assertion is contradicted by radiocarbon dating of fossils, as well as modern understanding of genetics, evolution, and cosmology. For instance, astrophysical evidence suggests that the universe is approximately 13.8 billion years old. Moreover, 10,000 years is not enough time to account for the current amount of genetic variation in humans. If all humans were descended from two individuals that lived less than 10,000 years ago, it would require an impossibly high rate of mutation to reach humanity's current level of genetic diversity. The argument that the literal story of Genesis can qualify as science collapses on three major grounds. The creationists need to invoke miracles in order to compress the events of the Earth's history into the biblical span of a few thousand years, their unwillingness to abandon claims clearly disproved, including the assertion that all fossils are products of nose flood, and their reliance upon distortion, misquote, half quote, and citation out of context to characterize the ideas of their opponents. Science faith think tanks such as the Biologos Foundation and Reasons to Believe have sought to reconcile these scientific challenges with the Christian faith. Archaeology According to one of the world's leading biblical archaeologists, William G. Dever, Archaeology certainly doesn. T prove literal readings of the Bible. It calls them into question, and that's what bothers some people. Most people really think that archaeology is out there to prove the Bible. No archaeologist thinks so. From the beginnings of what we call biblical archaeology, perhaps 150 years ago, scholars, mostly Western scholars, have attempted to use archaeological data to prove the Bible. And for a long time it was thought to work. William Albright, the great father of our discipline, often spoke of the archaeological revolution. Well, the revolution has come but not in the way that Albright thought. The truth of the matter today is that archaeology raises more questions about the historicity of the Hebrew Bible and even the New Testament than it provides answers, and that's very disturbing to some people. Dever also wrote, Archaeology as it is practiced today must be able to challenge, as well as confirm, the Bible stories. Some things described there really did happen, but others did not. The biblical narratives about Abraham, Moses, Joshua and Solomon probably reflect some historical memories of people and places, but the larger-than-life portraits of the Bible are unrealistic and contradicted by the archaeological evidence. I am not reading the Bible as scripture, I am in fact not even a theist. My view all along 
and especially in the recent books, is first that the biblical narratives are indeed stories, often fictional and almost always propagandistic, but that here and there they contain some valid historical information. According to Dever, the scholarly consensus is that the figure of Moses is legendary, and not historical. However, he states that a Moses-like figure may have existed somewhere in the southern Transjordan in the mid-13th century BC. Tel Aviv University archaeologist Zev Herzog wrote in the Haaretz newspaper, This is what archaeologists have learned from their excavations in the land of Israel. The Israelites were never in Egypt, did not wander in the desert, did not conquer the land in a military campaign and did not pass it on to the twelve tribes of Israel. Perhaps even harder to swallow is that the united monarchy of David and Solomon, which is described by the Bible as a regional power, was at most a small tribal kingdom. And it will come as an unpleasant shock to many that the God of Israel, YHWH, had a female consort and that the early Israelite religion adopted monotheism only in the waning period of the monarchy and not at Mount Sinai. Professor Finkelstein, who is known as the father of biblical archaeology, told the Jerusalem Post that Jewish archaeologists have found no historical or archaeological evidence to back the biblical narrative on the Exodus, the Jews, wandering in Sinai or Joshua's conquest of Canaan. On the alleged Temple of Solomon, Finkelstein said that there is no archaeological evidence to prove it really existed. Professor Yoni Mizrahi, an independent archaeologist who has worked with the International Atomic Energy Agency, agreed with Israel Finkelstein. Regarding the exodus of Israelites from Egypt, Egyptian archaeologist Zahi Hawass said, Really, it's a myth. This is my career as an archaeologist. I should tell them the truth. If the people are upset, that is not my problem. Topic. Prophecies Topic. The alleged fulfillment of biblical prophecies is a popular argument used as evidence by Christian apologists to support the claimed divine inspiration of the Bible. They see the fulfillment of prophecies as proof of God's direct involvement in the writing of the Bible. Topic. Messianic prophecies Topic. According to Christian apologists, the alleged fulfillment of the messianic prophecies in the mission, death, and resurrection of Jesus proves the accuracy of the Bible. However, according to Jewish scholars, Christian claims that Jesus is the Messiah of the Hebrew Bible are based on mistranslations and Jesus did not fulfill the qualifications for Jewish Messiah. An example of this is Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Christians read Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 as a prophetic prediction of Jesus birth from a virgin, while Jews read it as referring to the birth of Ahaz's son, Hezekiah. They also point out that the word Alma, used in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, is part of the Hebrew phrase ha alma hara, meaning, the Alma is pregnant. Since the present tense is used, they maintain that the young woman was already pregnant and hence not a virgin. This being the case, they claim the verse cannot be cited as a prediction of the future. Topic. Prophecies after the event Topic. An example of an alleged after-the-fact prophecy is the little apocalypse recorded in the Olivet Discourse of the Gospel of Mark. It predicts the siege of Jerusalem and destruction of the Jewish Temple at the hands of the Romans in 70 AD. Most mainstream New Testament scholars consider this to be an ex eventu foretelling after the event, as are many of the prophecies in the Old Testament such those of Daniel 11, another example is Isaiah's prophecy about Cyrus the Great. Traditionally, the entire book of Isaiah is believed to predate the rule of Cyrus by about 120 years. These particular passages Isaiah chapters 40 to 55, often referred to as Deutero-Isaiah are believed by most modern critical scholars to have been added by another author toward the end of the Babylonian exile ca. 536 BC. Whereas Isaiah chapters 1 to 39 referred to as Proto-Isaiah saw the destruction of Israel as imminent, and the restoration in the future, Deutero-Isaiah speaks of the destruction in the past Isa 42 and the restoration as imminent Isaiah chapter 42 verses 1 to 9. 
Notice, for example, the change in temporal perspective from Isaiah chapter 39 verses 6 to 7, where the Babylonian captivity is cast far in the future, to Isaiah chapter 43 verse 14, where the Israelites are spoken of as already in Babylon. Topic: The success of Joshua. Topic. The Book of Joshua describes the Israelite conquest of Canaan under the leadership of Joshua, the son of one of the aides to Moses. After Moses's death, God tells Joshua to conquer Canaan and makes predictions of his success. Amongst other things, Joshua was to be given a vast dominion that included all of the Hittite land, and the advantage of facing no one who could stand up to him. While the Book of Joshua delineates many successful conquerings, the Canaanites were not amongst those conquered and the Israelites did suffer defeat. Judah, a leader of one of the twelve tribes of Israel, is unable to dislodge the Jebusites from Jerusalem and was forced to cohabit. While the Manassites, another of the twelve tribes, lacked the strength to occupy several Canaan towns. Other bastions of resistance dot the landscape. Even after Joshua's death, the land is only partially conquered with the Canaanites remaining a significant external threat. Critics argue that Joshua never lives to see the full territory God promises him and that the substantial resistance put up by the indigenous population violates God's promise of battles in which no enemy was his equal. The destruction of Tyre Ezekiel predicts that the ancient city of Tyre will be utterly destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and made a bare rock that will never be rebuilt Ezekiel chapter 26 verses 1 26 7 to 14 however Tyre withstood Nebuchadnezzar's siege for 13 years ending in a compromise in which the royal family was taken into exile but the city survived intact apologists cite the text as saying that the prophecy states that many nations would accomplish the destruction of Tyre and claim that this refers to later conquerors Ezekiel chapter 26 verse 3 but skeptics counter that this was a reference to the many nations of Nebuchadrezzar S multinational force Nebuchadrezzar was described by Ezekiel as king of kings i.e. an overking a ruler over many nations Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 1 14 18 promises the Jewish captives would return from Babylon coming from many nations and that subsequent conquerors didn't permanently destroy Tyre either it is now the fourth largest city in Lebanon Ezekiel himself admitted later that Nebuchadnezzar could not defeat Tyre Ezekiel chapter 29 verse 18 Ezekiel said Egypt would be made an uninhabited wasteland for 40 years Ezekiel chapter 29 verses 10 to 14 and Nebuchadnezzar would be allowed to plunder it Ezekiel chapter 29 verses 19 to 20 as compensation for his earlier failure to plunder Tyre see above However the armies of Pharaoh Amasis II defeated the Babylonians History records that this pharaoh, also known as Amos II, went on to enjoy a long and prosperous reign. Herodotus writes that it is said that it was during the reign of Amos II that Egypt attained its highest level of prosperity, both in respect of what the river gave the land and in respect of what the land yielded to men, and that the number of inhabited cities at that time reached in total 20,000. The prophecy in chapter 29 dates in December 588, January 587. Twenty years later, in the year 568, Nebuchadnezzar attacked Egypt. F. F. Bruce writes still more exactly that the Babylonian king invaded Egypt already after the siege of Tyre 585, 573 BC and replaced the pharaoh Hophra Apres by Amasis. The siege of Tyre was followed by operations against Egypt itself. Hophra was defeated, deposed and replaced by Amasis, an Egyptian general. But in 568 BC Amasis revolted against Nebuchadnezzar, who then invaded and occupied part of the Egyptian frontier lands. Flavius Josephus even writes in his Antiquities, citing the 4th century Greek writer Megasthenes that Nebuchadnezzar had control of all northern Africa unto present day Spain. Megasthenes also, in his fourth book of his Accounts of India, makes mention of these things, and thereby endeavors to show that this king Nebuchadnezzar exceeded Hercules in fortitude, and in the greatness of his actions, for he said that he conquered a great part of Libya and Iberia. On the other hand, Nebuchadnezzar makes no mention of this campaign against Egypt in his inscriptions, at least that are currently known. 
It is too simple to argue with Herodotus, especially because his credibility was ever since contested. The forty years are not to understand as an exact number. This figure became a significant period of chastisement to the Hebrews remembering the forty years in the desert after the exodus from Egypt. The protection of the king of Judah Isaiah spoke of a prophecy God made to Ahaz, the king of Judah that he would not be harmed by his enemies Isaiah chapter 7 verses 1 to 7, yet according to 2 Chronicles, the king of Aram and Israel did conquer Judah 2 Chronicles chapter 28 verses 1 to 6, in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 9 the prophet says clearly that a prerequisite for the fulfillment of the prophecy is that Ahaz stands firm in his faith. F. F. Bruce claims that this means Ahaz should trust God and not seek military help in the Assyrians, which Ahaz did. The death of the king of Judah In predicting Jerusalem's fall to Babylon, Jeremiah prophesied that Zedekiah, the king of Judah, would die in peace. Jeremiah chapter 34 verses 2-5. However, according to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 52 verses 9 to 11, he was put in prison until the day of his death. Apologists maintain that Zedekiah did not suffer the same terrible death as all the other nobles of Judah did when Nebuchadnezzar killed them in Riblah. Jeremiah also told Zedekiah in his prophecy that he would have to go to Babylon, which the apologists claim implies that he will be imprisoned. There are no historical records of what happened with Zedekiah in Babylon and a peaceful death is not ruled out. The death of Josiah Prophetess Huldah prophesied that Josiah would die in peace 2 Kings 22 verses 18 but rather than dying in peace, as the prophetess predicted, Josiah was probably killed at Megiddo in a battle with the Egyptian army 2 Chronicles 35 verses 20-24. Apologists allege that the prophecy of Huldah was partially fulfilled because Josiah did not see all the disaster the Babylonians brought over Jerusalem and Judah. The prophetess clearly stated that because of Josiah, S repentance, he will be buried in peace. But the king did not keep his humble attitude. As mentioned in 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 35 verse 22, he did not listen to God's command and fought against the Egyptian pharaoh Necho. It is quite possible that he did this, opposing the faithful prophetic party. Prophecy in the biblical sense is except in some very few cases never a foretelling of future events but it wants to induce the hearers to repent, to admonish and to encourage respectively. Biblical prophecy includes almost always a conditional element. The land promised to Abraham According to Genesis and Deuteronomy, Genesis chapter 15 verse 18, 17 to 8 and Deuteronomy chapter 1 verses 7 to 8, Abraham and his descendants, the Israelites will unconditionally, Deuteronomy chapter 9 verses 3 to 7, own all the land between the Nile River and the Euphrates River for an everlasting possession. This never happened, an apologist's counter claim would be that a reading of Davidic conquests tells of the Israelite occupation of all the promised lands. FF Bruce writes David's sphere of influence now extended from the Egyptian frontier on the Wadi El Arish the Brook of Egypt to the Euphrates, and these limits remained the ideal boundaries of Israel's dominion long after David's empire had disappeared. Acts chapter 7 verse 5 and Hebrews chapter 11 verse 13 are taken out of context if used as evidence against the fulfillment of these prophecies. Stephen does not state in Acts that the prophecy was not fulfilled. Moreover, it does not seem any problem for him to mention side by side the promise to Abraham himself and that Abraham did not get even a foot of ground. This becomes understandable with the concept of corporate personality. Jews are familiar with identifying individuals with the group they belong to. H. Wheeler Robinson writes that corporate personality is the important Semitic complex of thought in which there is a constant oscillation between the individual and the group. Family, tribe, or nation to which he belongs, so that the king or some other representative figure may be said to embody the group, or the group may be said to sum up the host of individuals. The letter to the Hebrews speaks about the promise of the heavenly country Hebrews chapter 11 verses 13 to 16. 
Topic: The fate of Damascus. Topic: According to Isaiah chapter 17 verse 1, Damascus will no longer be a city but will become a heap of ruins. But in fact Damascus is considered among the oldest continually inhabited cities in the world. An apologist's response to this statement is that this verse refers to the destruction of Damascus as a strong capital of Syria. This was fulfilled during the Syro-Ephraimite War. The prophecy perhaps dates from about 735 BC, when Damascus and Israel were allied against Judah Isaiah chapter 7 verse 1, Damascus was taken by Tiglath-Pileser in 732, and Samaria by Sargon in 721. The passage is consistent with 2 Kings chapter 16 verse 9, which states that Assyria defeated the city and exiled the civilians to Kir. The mythicist position is that, Damascus is not Damascus, Syria, but Qumran, in Jordan, land of the Essenes. Topic. The fate of Jews who stay in Egypt Topic. According to Jeremiah chapter 42 verse 17, Jews who choose to live in Egypt will all die and leave no remnant. But history shows that Jews continued to live there for centuries, and for a time the Hellenistic Jewish cultural center at Alexandria was the largest urban Jewish community in the world. While declining greatly due to conflict and conversion, Egypt's Jews numbered some 75,000 as recently as the 1940s. According to apologists, the surrounding text suggests that Jeremiah is stating that no refugees who flee to Egypt would return to Israel except for few fugitives. Jeremiah 42-44 had relevance mainly to the group of exiles who fled to Egypt. It emphasizes that the future hopes of a restored Israel lay elsewhere than with the exiles to Egypt. Topic. The return of Jewish prisoners of war Topic. Isaiah and Jeremiah Isaiah chapter 27 verses 12 to 13 Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 18 Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 1 to 23 and Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 7 predicted the return of the exiles taken from Israel by the Assyrians in 722 BC It never happened Following the conquest of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians in 721 BC the 10 tribes were gradually assimilated by other peoples and thus disappeared from history Unlike the Kingdom of Judah, which was able to return from its Babylonian captivity in 537 BC, the ten tribes of the Kingdom of Israel never had a foreign edict granting permission to return and rebuild their homeland. Assyria has long since vanished, its capital, Nineveh, destroyed in 612 BC apologists, however, charge that Luke chapter 2 verse 36 states that Anna the prophetess, daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, was living as a widow in the sanctuary ministering to God with and fastings and petitions night and day. Thus, at least some tiny portion of Israel returned, since it was unlikely that a lone female would return to the land of Israel unaccompanied by kinsmen as safe escort. Although the exiled Israelites from the northern kingdom did not return from Assyria, apologists state that it must be considered that these passages also contain the expectation of the messianic days. Theologians point out that in Isaiah chapter 27 verses 12 to 13 Euphrates and the Wadi of Egypt represent the northern and southern borders of the promised land in its widest extent Genesis chapter 15 verse 18 and thus they refer these verses to the return of the Israelites to Jerusalem in the last days, in the messianic time. Israelites will be gathered from wherever they have been expelled from the north, Assyria, to the south, Egypt. Jeremiah's prophecy of Israel's and Judah return from the north in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 18 is preceded by the request of Yahweh to the Israelites to come back verse 14. After fulfilling this condition God will increase their number and none will miss the Ark of the Covenant verse 16. All nations will then honor the Lord verse 17. Consequently, Christian scholars refer verse 18 to messianic times when there will be a kingdom united as in the days of David and Solomon. Jeremiah 31 should be seen in context with chapter 30. Some scholars argue that these chapters were written early in Jeremiah's ministry and refer to northern Israel. Later these poems were updated and referred to Judah as well, probably by Jeremiah himself, when it was realized that Judah had passed through similar experiences to those of Israel. The Book of Consolation Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 1, 
31-40 reaches his final, messianic scope in the establishment of a new covenant between Yahweh and the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The strength of Judah Isaiah chapter 19 verse 17 predicted that, "...the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt." Assuming that the "...terror," implied was a large-scale military attack of Egypt, it never happened, according to theologians, the statement that the "...land of Judah." Will terrify the Egyptians is not a reference to a large army from Judah attacking Egypt, but a circumlocution for the place where God lives, it is God and his plans that will terrify Egypt. Verse 17 has to be understood in its context. The second, in that day, message from verse 18 announces the beginning of a deeper relationship between God and Egypt, which leads to Egypt's conversion and worshipping God. Verses 19-21. The last in that day prophecy verses 23 to 25 speaks about Israel, Assyria and Egypt as God's special people, thus describing eschatological events. Topic: The identity of the conquerors of Babylon. Topic: Isaiah chapter 13 verse 17, Isaiah chapter 21 verse 2, Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 11, and Jeremiah chapter 51 verses 27 to 28 predicted that Babylon would be destroyed by the Medes, Ararat, Mini and Ashkenaz and Elamites. The Persians under Cyrus the Great captured Babylon in 539 BC. Daniel chapter 5 verse 31 incorrectly stated that it was Darius the Mede who captured Babylon. Christian apologists state that the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 13 verse 21 could possibly have been directed originally against Assyria, whose capital Nineveh was defeated 612 BC by a combined onslaught of the Medes and Babylonians. According to this explanation the prophecy was later updated and referred to Babylon not recognizing the rising power of Persia. On the other hand, it can be mentioned that the Persian king Cyrus after overthrowing Media in 550 BC did not treat the Medes as a subject nation, instead of treating the Medes as a beaten foe and a subject nation, he had himself installed as king of Media and governed Media and Persia as a dual monarchy, each part of which enjoyed equal rights. Jeremiah prophesied at the height of the Median Empire's power, and thus he was probably influenced to see the Medes as the nation that will conquer Babylon. Several proposals were brought forth for Darius the Mede, out of which one says that Cyrus the Great is meant in Daniel chapter 5 verse 31. Topic: <laughs> Jehoiakim prophecies. Topic: The prophet Daniel states that in the 3rd year of the reign of King Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah. Daniel chapter 1 verses 1 to 2. The third year of Jehoiakim's reign was 605 BC, at which time Nebuchadnezzar was not yet king of Babylon. It was in 597 BC that Nebuchadnezzar takes Jerusalem, by then Jehoiakim had died. Apologists respond that this is not a prophecy but a statement. Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 is a problem of dating. But already ff. Bruce solved this problem explaining that when Nebuchadnezzar, son of King Nabopolassar, was put in charge over a part of his forces, he defeated Necho in the Battle of Carchemish 605 BC. In this situation his father Nabopolassar died. Before Nebuchadnezzar as heir apparent returned to Babylon he settled the affairs in the Asiatic countries bordering the Egyptian frontier, which means also Judah, and took captives from several countries as, for example, also from the Jews. Jeremiah prophesied that the body of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, would be desecrated after his death. Jeremiah chapter 22 verses 18 to 19, Jeremiah chapter 36 verses 30 to 31. However, his death was recorded in 2 Kings chapter 24 verse 6 where it says that Jehoiakim slept with his fathers. This is a familiar Bible expression that was used to denote a peaceful death and respectful burial. David slept with his fathers 1 Kings chapter 2 verse 10 and so did Solomon 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 43 On the other hand 2 Chronicles chapter 36 verses 5 to 6 states that Nebuchadnezzar came against Jehoiakim bound him in fetters and carried him to Babylon 
Judging from the treatment Zedekiah was accorded when the Babylonians bound him and carried him away to Babylon Jeremiah chapter 52 verses 9 one might justifiably argue that his body probably was desecrated after his death. Jeremiah, however, predicted that Jehoiakim's own people would be his desecrators, that his own people would not accord him lamentations appropriate for a king, that his own people would cast his body out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. Apologists' proposal for a partial solution in the seventh year of his reign, in the month of Kislev December, January 598-97, Nebuchadnezzar himself left Babylon and undertook the subjection of rebellious Judah. In that same month, King Jehoiakim died in Jerusalem, on the basis of a comparison with 2 Kings chapter 24 verses 6, 8, 10 ff, with the Babylonian Chronicle, Wiseman 73, lines 11-13, Kislev is the ninth month. In the twelfth month, Adar, Jerusalem was taken. Jehoiakim's reign falls in these three months, it is not impossible that he was murdered by a political faction who thereby sought more mild treatment for their country. His 18-year-old son Jehoiakim was raised to the throne 2 Kings 24 verse 8. Three months later Jerusalem was entirely surrounded by Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to the city of Judah al and on the second day of the month of Adar he conquered the city and took its king prisoner. Also ff. Bruce writes that Jehoiakim died in Judah before the siege of Jerusalem began. This would mean that Jehoiakim was desecrated after his death and in this way the prophecy of Jeremiah was fulfilled. The passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 verses 5 to 6 does not speak explicitly about Jehoiakim's death. Thus, it can be seen as a parallel to Daniel chapter 1 verses 1 to 2 which speaks about an event in the lifetime of the king of Judah see paragraph above, 2 Kings chapter 24 verse 6, nevertheless, remains unclear. Part of the desecration prophecy was that Jehoiakim would have no one to sit upon the throne of David, Jeremiah chapter 36 verse 30, but this too was proven false. Upon Jehoiakim death, his son Jehoiakim reigned in his stead for a period of three months and ten days 2 Chronicles 36 verses 8-9, 2 Kings 24 verses 6-8. Also, there are biblical genealogies that purport to show Jehoiakim as a direct ancestor of Jesus 1 Chronicles 3 verses 16-17, Matthew 1 verses 11-12, Apologists say that if Jehoiakim had not been killed by his own people, on the condition that this supposition is true see preceding paragraph, in all likelihood, Jehoiakim would have been put to death by the Babylonians. The Israelites anticipated what Nebuchadnezzar intended to do. In this case, most probable, Jehoiakim's son Jehoiakim would not have become king and Jeremiah's prophecy would have been fulfilled in its full sense. Jehoiakim S. successor, Zedekiah, was no descendant of Jehoiakim, but his brother. The double reckoning of Jehoiakim in Matthew chapter 1 verses 11-12 is made possible by the fact that the same Greek name can translate the two similar Hebrew names Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim. In this way in verse 11 Jehoiakim and in verse 12 Jehoiakim is meant. The verse Jeremiah chapter 36 verse 30 says that Jehoiakim's descendants will not be kings in Judah anymore. This does not mean that he cannot be an ancestor of the Messiah. Topic: New Testament. Topic: According to Luke chapter 19 verses 41 to 44, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, "If you even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes." The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. It may be argued that the utterance that, No stone, would be left upon another, Matt, 24-2, Mark chapter 13 verse 2, Luke chapter 19 verse 44, Luke chapter 21 verse 6 was intended as hyperbole. However, the prophecy did not eventuate in the literal sense, as the Wailing Wall, a remnant of the Second Temple Courtyard Wall, still remains. In reply, John Robinson writes, It was the temple that perished by fire while the walls of the city were thrown down. Topic. The imminence of the second coming. 
Topic. Jesus prophesied that the second coming would occur during the lifetime of his followers and Caiaphas, and immediately after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 CE referred to as abomination of desolation in Matt 24 15. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Matthew chapter 16 verses 27-28. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Matthew chapter 10 verse 23. Again the high priest Caiaphas asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Mark chapter 14 verses 61 to 62 Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another, every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us. They said. When will this happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of the house. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. Immediately after the distress of those days the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky, with power and great glory. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Matthew chapter 24. See also Mark chapter 13 verses 1 to 30, Luke chapter 21 verses 5 to 35, Mark chapter 13 verses 30 to 31, Mark chapter 9 verse 1, Luke chapter 9 verse 27, John chapter 21 verse 22, Matthew chapter 26 verses 62 to 64, Mark chapter 14 verse 62. It may be argued that Jesus was not speaking of the second coming in Matthew chapter 16 verse 28 but instead referred to a demonstration of his or God's might, a viewpoint which allows the fulfillment of the prophesy through a variety of traumatic events, notably, the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in 70 AD. The temple's destruction is held by proponents to demonstrate that God was on the side of the Christian people rather than that of the Jews. However, at that time only some of Jesus' disciples still lived. In the same way Matthew chapter 10 verse 23 should be understood. Note, however, that this view referred to as preterism is not the majority view among American denominations, especially by denominations that espouse dispensationalism. Furthermore, it is a misunderstanding that Jesus meant Caiaphas in Mark chapter 14 verse 62. The word, you will see, is in Greek, opsist. Opsist, from the infinitive optimi, which is plural and not singular. Jesus meant that the Jews, and not just the high priest, will see his coming. This prophecy is also seen in the revelation of Jesus to John. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Revelation chapter 1 verses 1, 7. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Revelation chapter 22 verses 7, 12, 20. 
Despite the strongly repeated promises to the seven churches of Asia Revelation chapter 1 verses 4, 11 in the first century CE, Jesus has not come quickly or shortly according to critics. Apologists respond that the word, soon, other translations use, shortly, or quickly, does not have to be understood in the sense of close future. The Norwegian scholar Thorleif Bowman explained that the Israelites, unlike Europeans or people in the West, did not understand time as something measurable or calculable according to Hebrew thinking but as something qualitative. We have examined the ideas underlying the expression of calculable time and more than once have found that the Israelites understood time as something qualitative, because for them time is determined by its content less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 the Semitic concept of time is closely coincident with that of its content without which time would be quite impossible. The quantity of duration completely recedes behind the characteristic feature that enters with time or advances in it. Johannes Peterson comes to the same conclusion when he distinguishes sharply between the Semitic understanding of time and ours. According to him, time is for us an abstraction since we distinguish time from the events that occur in time. The ancient Semites did not do this, for them time is determined by its content. In this way expressions of time, such as soon, do not mean that the denoted event will take place in close future but that it will be the next significant event. The Apostle Paul also predicted that the second coming would be within his own lifetime, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will be with the Lord forever. The philosopher Porphyry 232 CE, in his Cata Christianon Against the Christians, a book burned and banned by the Church in 448 CE writes of Paul, Another of his astonishingly silly comments needs to be examined, I mean that wise saying of his, to the effect that, we who are alive and persevere shall not precede those who are asleep when the Lord comes, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the trumpet of God shall sound, and those who have died in Christ shall rise first then we who are alive shall be caught up together with them in a cloud to meet the Lord in the air. Indeed, there is something here that reaches up to heaven, the magnitude of this lie. When told to dumb bears, to silly frogs and geese, they bellow or croak or quack with delight to hear of the bodies of men flying through the air like birds or being carried about on the clouds. This belief is quackery of the first rate. The Apologists Answer for the passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17 is that Paul speaks about his own presence at the last day only hypothetically. He identifies himself with those Christians who will still live in the time of Jesus. Return but does not want to express that he himself will still experience this. That becomes fully clear some verses later in which he says that the day of the Lord comes like a thief. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 to 2. The comparison of the day of the Lord with a thief is a word of Jesus himself Matthew chapter 24 verses 43 to 44 which expresses the impossibility to say anything about the date of his second coming Matthew chapter 24 verse 36 Topic Notable Critics Topic Richard Dawkins Matt Dillahunty Albert Einstein Sam Harris Christopher Hitchens Robert G. Ingersoll Thomas Jefferson Thomas Paine Bertrand Russell Mark Twain Voltaire Topic. See also Topic. Bible conspiracy theory Criticism of the Book of Mormon Criticism of the Talmud Criticism of the Quran Misquoting Jesus Tarif Topic. References Topic. Topic. Further reading Topic. The Encyclopedia of Biblical Errancy, by C. Dennis McKinsey Prometheus Books 1995. The Historical Evidence for Jesus, by G. A. Wells Prometheus Books 1988. The Bible Unearthed, by I. Finkelstein and N. Asherman Touchstone 2001. 
David and Solomon, by I. Finkelstein and N. Asherman Free Press 2006. The Jesus Mysteries, by T. Freak and P. Gandhi Element 1999. The Jesus Puzzle, by Earl Doherty Age of Reason Publications 1999. Not the Impossible Faith, by R. Carrier Lulu 2009. B.C. The Archaeology of the Bible Lands, by Magnus Magnuson Bodley Head 1977. Godless, by Dan Barker Ulysses Press 2008. Why I Became an Atheist, by John W. Loftus Prometheus Books 2008. The Greatest Show on Earth, by Richard Dawkins Black Swan 2007. The God Delusion, by Richard Dawkins Black Swan 2010. 101 Myths of the Bible by Gary Greenberg Sourcebooks 2000. Secret Origins of the Bible by Tim Callahan Millennium Press 2002. The Origins of Biblical Monotheism by Mark S. Smith Oxford University Press 2001. Topic. External links Topic. Bible Research — The Gender Neutral Bible Controversy Introduction to the Bible and Biblical Problems — Internet Infidels Website Examination of the Prophecies — Examination of the Old Testament Prophecies of Jesus by Thomas Paine